This is Adapala Academy's current affairs discussion videos for the month of March 2019. Here the subjects are environment, energy and ICT. The topic selected uh, solid plastic waste, Sundarban wetlands, national hydro policy, India cooling action plan, Jeevan, solar park scheme, star rating program, and National Knowledge Network. Ban on import of solid plastic waste. The news was that the government has plugged a loophole that allowed import of plastic waste to into India for processing by amending the hazardous waste management and transboundary movement rules. So we have different rules for Managing the solid waste, e-waste separately, plastic waste separately, hazardous waste separately, biomedical waste separately. So, in one such rule is regarding the hazardous waste. So, this rule is amended to ban import of plastic waste. And this hazardous waste movement is, that is movement is transboundary movement means movement between the countries is regulated by certain international conventions also. So, Ro Rotterdam in Rotterdam Convention regulate the movement of chemicals from one country to another because these are hazardous substances so its movement has to be regulated. So using such pro rules in the has banned the import of plastic waste. Some of the e-waste, some plastic waste etc. can also be hazardous because they may contain some harmful chemicals. So earlier also we had import ban but it was only partial. It is partial because industries located in special economic zones, sites were allowed to import plastic waste. Sites are certain area demarcated where industries are situated such that they are ruled by different rules. They have different tax taxation rules, they have different customs duties. It is mainly aimed to promote export from the country so that they are given some concessions. So earlier ban was not including the sets. So this loophole in the law was used by the industries in sets to import plastic waste. Also there are certain export, export oriented units which was also pro procuring waste from foreign countries and recycling and Selling it. This export oriented units will be mainly aimed to export. So, for promoting exports, these units are also given certain concessions. Now, there will be a question why a country should import waste? So, generally, we try to eliminate waste from the country, then why we should import? This is because there are certain countries which do not find this recycling industry as lucrative they will not be having enough manpower or cheap labor to do this kind of works. So they will export the waste to countries like India and China. There the recycling centers will be there and they will do this work. It is somewhat like outsourcing. In software industries we are familiar with the outsourcing. Here also they are outsourcing their waste recycling to other countries. Why this step? This step was necessary because we have no efficient waste collection system. So it is mainly going in informal sector in India. They don't have any hygienic environment for the work. There is no protective equipment from the hazardous chemicals. They are not covered under any social security rules. No minimum wage. No limit on the working hours like that. So such industry, such informal industry is uh, having its own in inefficiency. So we don't have any formalized system for waste collection. Now the recent rules also tells like the producer of the waste, producer of the plastic products have the responsibility to collect the plastic waste also. But for that collection system we have, we should have formalized collection centers and collection channels but that is lacking in India. And even if the waste is collected, it is not segregated properly. It means that there are different types of waste which can be recycled, which cannot be recycled, which can be used for energy recovery, which has to be thrown out in landfills like that. And third, we don't have adequate capacity of recycling plastic. So the amount of waste generated in India 
and the amount of installed capacity for recycling is not matching there is a gap so we ourselves are not recycling the waste we are generating above that we are importing the waste and this partial ban was misused by many companies in sets and they were importing the waste for export and above that in recently india has committed to completely phase out single use plastic by 2022 so this year gandhi jayanti also you will remember the main motto was to eliminate the plastic waste so the prime minister have given a call to the nation to be aware of the plastic waste and adopt the ways to reduce the plastic waste and we have to completely eliminate the use of single use plastic what are the single use plastic that plastic items that are used only for once say juice bottles bottle caps food covering snacks packets so like this kind of items we will use for one time and throw it away so this form the major portion of the litter that is forming and these items will be mainly very thin so they will be easily bre breaking down breaking down into small small pieces and that is more dangerous because they will be entering the food chain also and here we have to note that we have also banned the plastics which is less than 50 micron in thickness so why this 50 micron why we should ban the plastic less than 50 micron thickness this is to eliminate the litter so once it is very thick we will simply litter it so but, but if it is a little thick we will be we will tend to reuse it when the plastic cover is also small plastic cover which is tearing very easily we will just leave it right but bigger plastic cover we will tend to reuse so for eliminating such littering government has stipulated that minimum thickness should be 50 microns so the significance can be in terms of the environment sustainable development and reducing the impact on environment why we should study this topic so here last year if you see this plastic waste has come in news in different ways so when we have committed for elimination second uh, swachh bharat itself has now oriented towards the plastic waste so this news is recurring this year so there are chances of questions in esc regarding plastic so it can be about the rules it can be about plastic recycling it can be about the properties of plastic so in any any manner question can come so in 2017 there was a question on reasons for low rate of plastic recycling scrap plastic has little value because virgin material is rather cheap so instead of collecting and recycling plastic it is cheaper to produce the new material and use it so that is on point they were so that industries are not going for recycling once the volume of the product is higher we have to spend more money on transport and handling recycling leads to very severe public health hazard recycling will help the environment so that these chemicals and additives and contaminants in the plastic won't go to the environment instead it will be helpful for the environment this recycling industry may be hazardous because of the nature of the material substances involved there but with proper precautions it can be eliminated so uh, this recycling is not a hazard not a health hazard answer is b so what could be the possible question one such question can be about the rules right the reasons for imposing ban on plastic waste import to india can be first india recycles a higher percentage of this plastic waste than most countries this statement is actually true compared to many other countries a higher percentage of the plastic waste generated is recycled in india but this is not the reason why we should impose a ban on plastic waste right so this statement cannot be selected there is a huge gap between waste generation and recycling capacity of india even though we are recycling higher percentage compared to other countries still there exists a gap in the generation and recycling capacity so b is the answer
protecting the Sundarban wetlands. Indian Sundarban was accorded the status of wetland of international importance under the Rams Convention. So that is the news. So, as of now, we had 26 sites which is recognized as wetlands of international importance under Ramsar Convention. So Ramsar Convention is dealing with the wetlands. It has identified certain wetlands across the globe so that it can be protected. And in India, there were 26 sites. Now, Addition, one addition has come this Indian Sundarbans. So Indian Sundarbans. Now there are 27 sites. So later in news, one more site has also come that we will see in our coming lectures. So now you remember that now there are 28. Where is Sundarban located? Sundarban is actually a mangrove forest which is located in India and Bangladesh. So India and Bangladesh is sharing this Sundarbans. It got its name because of the tree. Mangrove tree is called Sundari tree. So because of the abundance of that Sundari tree in this delta, it got its name as Sundarbans. And this portion, Bangladesh portion of Sundarbans was, is already in the Ramsar site. So now Indian portion of Sundarbans also included in the Ramsar site. List. So you can see that it is a delta portion. Delta portion is the portion where the river is joining the sea and it will be depositing huge amount of sediments. So these lands are made of sediments from the river. So it will be... A, you can imagine it will be always some marshy or sampy or wetland kind of wet regions. So here the two large river rivers are joining here. It is Ganga and Brahmaputra. So both joining together is making this huge delta. So this mangrove delta is one of the largest mangrove forest as a single block in the world. So it comprises of hundreds of islands, network of rivers, tributaries, creeks. Creeks are the places where the water body is going into the land like this. So this is water, land, they are creeks. It is in the delta of Ganga and Brahmaputra. It constitutes over 60% of country's total mangrove forest area. So total mangrove forest area we are calculating in India. More than half of that mangrove forest is located here. So this is on 27th Ramsar site in India. It is the largest protected wetland in the country. So when it is added, it is the having the largest area among the Ramsar sites in India. It is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It is home to the Royal Bengal Tiger. So we are, have different measures to protect the tiger. So tiger is an important animal. It is home to that tiger. So generally wetlands are important. That's why we are having an international convention to protect the wetlands and to make the people aware of their importance. Why we need these steps? Because traditionally wetlands were considered as a wasteland where the river is dumping the waste sediments. So it looks ugly and they were considered as a wasteland to dump, dump waste. But these lands are ecologically significant. We have seen in our classes how the wetlands are ecologically significant. They have very good recycling rate. They will support biodiversity. They will help to purify water. They act as buffer storages for water. So release water during drought times and absorbs water during flood times. So these are the important ecological services that a wetland is providing. So earlier we used to reclaim the west wetlands to make it as a farmland or any industrial sites or for buildings. <laughs> After effect of it, we are seeing in different cities like Chennai. Because during floods, the natural buffer storage of the wetland is lost and the city will be flooded. 
so it will provide fresh water food and nature shock observer for different calamities critical for biodiversity but they are disappearing rapidly so we need measures to protect the wetlands what are the major causes of degradation changes in land use they will be converted to use for agriculture and other purposes like and grazing constructions diversion so when water is having river is having water only they will bring lot of sediments so if river is in between diverted to other uh, canals or blocked in dams the deltas want to get sediments if deltas want to get sediments they will slowly reduce in their site they will lose it to sea the sediments will be lost to sea if it is not balanced properly how this site sundarbans qualified as a ramsar site for qualifying as a ramsar site there are nine criteria so some of the criteria should be met for qualifying as the wetland of international importance so this ramsar site has met four out of the nine criteria proposed what are those criteria presence of rare species and threatened ecological communities so what are the rare species here we have royal bengal tiger and aquatic animals like river terrapin crocodiles etc and the significant and representative fish and fish spawning ground migratory path fish spawning ground means where the fishes are breeding yes calcutta sorry sundarbans wetlands is a major fishing ground people fishing is a major activity there economical activity there and they form a place for the migratory birds migratory birds will come to this wetlands during their migration it is home to large number of rare and globally threatened species yes it is home to almost 2000 fauna species and 90 percentage of countries mangrove varieties so biodiversity also significant in this wetland so how this status to the ram um, how this status to the sundarbans will help so it will highlight the conservation issues at the international level so there are new methods new scientific methods new technologies etc will be available for us and there will be cooperation between india and bangladesh for the protection of this ecosystem it is continuous ecosystem so both countries have to cooperate and better conservation strategy for black species such as tiger and northern river terrapin so this kind of flag species species we are already conserving so we will get better strategy for conserving these animals so what are the threats especially for the sundarban wetlands main threat is that it is it is having pressure from the population so north of that even if you have seen the map it is in the delta a north of the delta region is the calcutta city so calcutta city is a metro city and there are uh, is pressure this population pressure demand on the resources is high in, uh, that is felt in this delta region also so northern northwest is a highly populated area they are putting pressure on the ecosystem in terms of the demand of the natural resources are also from the economical activities like a fishing farming etc so these natural ecosystems are being changed for cultivation of shrimp crab etc which will fetch money for people so the natural ecosystems will get destroyed also this delta have certain old resources so for resources there is dredging drilling etc and uh, this mangrove forest will be harvested for food oh, sorry mangrove forest will be harvested for wood and hunting of the animals so these are rampant in this area so when water resources are stressed it will get more saline more salinity will also affect the ecosystem and these places are especially vulnerable to climate change because they are in delta region even a small rise in sea level first this kind of low lying areas will be affected nowadays we will see once in a while we will see in news certain islands are disappearing in the delta region because of the rising sea levels small small islands are getting disappearing so the people are forced to migrate from this region what could be a possible question here on simple question is there 
largest protected wetland under Ramsar Convention in India is. So, if you have read this news, you can answer this question easily. There can be difficult questions from this topic also regarding the significance of wetland, how can we conserve wetland, etc. But this question is a direct question. Answer is C. New Hydro Policy the government decided to reclassify large hydroelectric projects as renewable energy. So, there is a policy change. Earlier, the policy has recognized only the projects which are less than 25 megavolt as renewable energy. So, hydro energy even though it is renewable, it is not considered as renewable by Major, major classifications because it involves the creation of huge dams which will be impounding large areas so that the forest and the vegetation and the settlements will be underwater. So decomposition of these materials will generate methane into the atmosphere. So methane is a greenhouse gas and it will add to the global warming. So such kind of drawbacks are there for the large hydropower projects. So generally large hydropower projects are not considered as green since, since these are not included under renewable energy. So, but now the government has decided to reclassify large hydroelectric projects are also under as under renewable energy. So how this will change? So before policy we had 75,000 megawatt as renewable resources. Now when Large hydropower power projects are also added, it will cross 1 lakh. Th that is the renewable energy number when we are trying to present our renewable energy capacity in international scenario or any audit or for data purposes, we can see that the renewable energy sources, its share in the energy mix of India will be increasing. And the Calculations, different calculations, different ratios, proportion, etc. also will change. So, earlier renewable energy was only 21% of India's total energy mix. Now, it will increase to 34.40%. So, within the renewable energy also, share of different renewable sources will differ. For example, hydro was only 6.03 before. Now, it will become 41% of the total renewable energy. And wind was 47 and now it is only 29. So earlier wind energy was having the largest portion among the re renewables, renewable energy in India. But now when hydropower is, how hydro policy is changed, hydro will become the largest portion in the renewable basket. So similarly the um, corresponding percentage of the other sources will also change. So, what does the policy say? We can see some of the rules that is associated with this policy change. Hydropower projects are separate entity within non-solar renewable purchase obligation. So, we have a mechanism called RPO, Renewable Purchase Obligation. Whereas, a power producer which is relying on fossil fuels or which is relying on any sources are supposed to generate a certain percentage of their total production from renewable sources. If they are not able to do so, they can purchase RPOs from the renewable purchase producer. So for example, a coal plant will be there, they will be producing 100% of their power from coal fairing. But they may not be able to divert to other renewable sources. So they can purchase this RPO from some other park, solar park may be there. So they will they will issue RPO certificates at some cost. So this can purchase it and they can comply with the rules. So even though they are not actually producing the power, they will be able to comply with the rules. So what does this do? This will encourage this renewable energy produces to produce energy. So many people will enter into the market, they will set up renewable energy power plants so that because they will be having a market, they will be able to sell. So they will be selling the power to the grid. So instead they will receive the 
certificates are pure certificates which they can sell to the people who are required. And there are tariff rationalization measures we, we need because their different power sources are there it will be costing different so for integrating all these power sources into the main grid there should be some rationalization measures for the power price between different sources. And there is budgetary support for funding flood moderation component to hydropower projects on case to base basis. This flood moderation component can be given support because large hydropower projects are having certain drawbacks. So for eliminating that budgetary supports can be given. Now what were the existing classification of the hydro projects? Micro is up to 100 kilowatt, mini is up, up to 2 megawatt, small is up to 25 megawatt. So this they are earlier considered as renewable but now this mega projects that is greater than 500 megavolt also included under the renewable category sources so we saw it before so why this topic is important so in 2017 there was a question green energy refers to one which does not harm the ecosystem of planet earth all renewable energy is green energy. So here is an example. Oh, we were not classifying large hydropower projects as renewable energy because they were not green. Even though it is renewable. Renewable by definition means we will be able to reuse the resources. And it will be and there is absolutely no waste in hydropower projects and the water resources are renewable. Then then also it is not renewable because of the reasons we discussed before because it is environmentally damaging in other ways. So this statement is wrong. Answer is C. So we can expect questions from energy sector in this category. India Cooling Action Plan Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has released India Cooling Action Plan. It is a long term vision to address the cooling requirement across sectors. It lists out the actions which can help reduce the cooling demand. So what is this cooling? This cooling mainly refers to the refrigerant and air conditioning needs. So we know that we are facing a climate change. It is getting warm year over year so there is an increasing demand for refrigeration and air conditioning services throughout the world so india is also a country which is experiencing this climate change so if you see your surroundings also you, you will understand nowadays there uh, nowadays it is difficult to stay in cities without any air conditioning or cooling mechanisms right so in future this demand will certainly increase and when this demand is increasing who is at the disadvantage the poor section is at a disadvantage because they will not be able to afford this kind of cooling needs they will suffer more when people are suffering more it will affect the economy they will not be able to work properly they will not be able to earn properly so the economy will be affected so considering that facts considering that facts and considering the climate change happening we have to come up with an action plan so as to protect ourselves so this is the action plan so what is the aim it is aimed to provide sustainable cooling and thermal comfort to all certain materials for construction instead of concrete it will help to reduce the heat content so such kind of methods that we are using in green building green building concept is like this we have to maximum use the natural resources and natural ways to reduce the power consumption in the building for this cooling and heating needs so sustainable cooling solutions and thermal comfort should be ensured while securing environment we should not consume more energy using more energy we can achieve this we can put air conditioning in all the rooms but that is not a sustainable solution because for producing energy we will consume more fossil fuel resources and it is again damaging to the environment so at the same time reducing the energy consumption we have to find some solution that is meant by the sustainable solutions and socio-economic benefits it should not be very costly also otherwise many people will be out of this 
so what is the action plan to reduce the cooling demand across sectors by 20 to 25 percent reduce refrigerant demand so by reducing the cooling demand we can reduce the refrigerant demand and this is applicable for in homes and also in industries also reducing cooling energy requirement so we are consuming energy for this refrigeration and air conditioning we have to reduce the energy requirement recognize cooling and related areas as a trust area of research under national science and technology program we are promoting researchers in different areas so this should also be an important area for our r d programs training and certification of Technician, service and sector, uh, sector technicians by synergizing with the skilling dimension. So, we can produce job, job for the people. If they are trained in the schooling sector, they will, there are job opportunities. They can be meaningfully employed. They will be getting a decent source of income. What are the thematic areas identified? Space cooling in buildings. Buildings, cold chain, cold chain. And refrigeration for industries mainly food processing industries cold chain is essential for food processing industries so it will help the farmers also transport air conditioning vehicle air conditioning air conditioning and refrigeration refrigeration servicing so technical sector servicing sector where technicians are required refrigerant demand and indigenous product production refrigerants are there so these refrigerants are in, environmentally important because many of the refrigerants that uh, we were using were ozone depleting if when we are eliminating the ozone depleting substance they will be global warming gases right so we have to come up with a, a effective refrigerant that is not ozone depleting nor global warming gas so we have to come up with indigenous solutions for the refrigerant demand so as of now we are depending on technology on other countries for the refrigerants which is not environmentally damaging so there should be r d and production sector for alternative refrigerants what are the benefits expected provision of cooling for economically weaker sessions and low income group housing so housing when they are constructing the housing itself the materials and the design should be selected such that there should be less demand on cooling so this will help the poor people to have that comfort levels so this is included in our pradhan mandri our yojana also so green component is also included there sustainable cooling the cooling should be sustainable it should not be consuming more environmental resources doubling farmers income they will do through the cold chain and refrigeration facilities they will be benefited production of skilled workforce make in india for r d investing in urban r d and coming up with the indigenous solutions and this will help in reducing both direct and indirect emissions so we have dis discussed many concepts and uh, many ideas so there can be different types of questions from this topic also one such question is provision of cooling is an important developmental necessity statement two cooling is linked to human health and productivity yes we, through this cooling action plan we are trying to achieve that cooling comfort to all sections of the population why because cooling is linked to human health and productivity temperature level is optimum there will be more productive humans will be more productive pradhan mandri jeevan yojana when you hear the name jeevan don't confuse it with any health related or biodiversity related or medical related yojana it is about biofuels Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs has approved Pradhan Mandri Jeevan Yojana. It is for providing financial support to second generation biofuels, biofuel plants. So here on time is their second generation. So you should have an idea about what this generation is. First generation means it is produced directly from food crops, from for biodiesel, bioethanol, from sugarcane, corn, rice, etc. 
but this will affect the food security so this first generation is not encouraged second generation is produced from non food crops wood waste food uh, food uh, that certain crops specially cultivated for biofuels like jetrofa so these are second generation also there can be waste to energy plants biodiesel plants from jetrofa six are examples third when we are specially engineering certain crops for energy needs it will be third so it means that it will involve more r&d and more technology so that is the next generation third generation certain algaes can be bioengineered to produce wide range of fuels like diesel petrol and jet fuel fourth is the advanced generation where we will use the second generation sources but at the same time it will capture carbon dioxide also so during industrial process certain carbon dioxide will be generated but in fourth fourth generation plants this carbon dioxide will be captured so that there will be net zero emission net emission net zero emission from the plant so what is this yojana under this 12 commercial cell demonstration scale second generation ethanol process will be approved via viability gap funding support in two phases so there are two phases of financial support for the projects financial scale projects and ten demonstration demonstration projects will be mainly for technology demonstration new technology demonstration so 12 plus 10 22 such projects will be financially supported what is this viability gap funding because there will be certain investment and there will be certain income from the plants but these plants may not be able to generate the whole investment so that gap will be funded by the government the extent up to which they are not able to recover their investment will be supported by the government and there are two phases in phase 1 six commercial projects and five demonstration projects will be uh, supported and in the second phase the remaining projects will be supported so what is this for this is to support the industry by creating a suitable ecosystem for setting up commercial projects and increasing the r&d in this area what are the benefits benefits include reducing import dependence by way of substituting fossil fuels with biofuels so we know we have discussed this before we are very deficit in the fossil fuel resources in the country so we have to find alternate fuel resources biofuels is one such opportunity fossil fuels are ghg emitting fuels so switching to biofuels will reduce the ghg emissions also and it will address the environmental concerns and improving farmer income how it will be improving farmer income because second generation plants will depend on waste bio waste this waste will mainly come from the crop lands crop residues are there after harvesting the crop remaining stem leaves etc will be wasted so for eliminating the waste farmers will burn it once it is dry it will be burned so it is no of no use it will add smoke to the atmosphere that's it but instead farmers can convert this waste to energy so this will generate additional income for the farmer it will create more employment opportunities in the rural regions yes there will be more people will be working in supplying this biomass to the plants people can work in plants so rural in rural areas also these plants can come up right and this will contribute to swachh bharat mission also it will be cleaning the surroundings from when waste we are collecting biodegradable waste we are collecting and converting to energy it will help in the swachhata also and another aim is indigenizing the second generation biomass to ethanol technology we have to develop technology on our own so this support will help people to come up with research and development projects oh we are going for ethanol we are converting biomass to ethanol what is this ethanol ethanol is product of fermentation of the biomass 
and this is like alcohol which can be blended in petrol so petrol plus ethanol can be used as fuel in vehicles so this is called ethanol blended petrol and government is encouraging the ethanol blending of petrol through a national program it was launched in 2003 so this have different benefits like it will give remuneration to farmers especially sugarcane farmers sugarcane waste can produce ethanol it will subsidize crude imports we can reduce the fuel fossil fuel consumption and it can achieve foreign exchange savings it can reduce our import bills so this ethanol blending program also evolved through years initially we were able to achieve only 4.22 percentage blending that is in 100 portion of petrol we will add 4.2 percentage of ethanol next year it reached 7.2 percentage and we had the target targets was also increased over time now the target is proposed to be 20 percentage new biofuel policy in 2018 has fixed a target of 20 percentage blending by 2030 what is the present target by 2022 we should achieve 10 percentage blend so the targets are also increased over time which are depend with if you are going for more blending it may need some design changes so instead of going for any drastic changes within the existing system how much we can achieve that is calculated and slowly we are going through it if you want to more blending it and the engine design should also change why this topic is important last year there was a question what are the advantages of biomass as the source of energy? The storage and transportation are possible. It is ecologically safe and inoffensive. It can be developed with the present man and material abilities. Low capital input is required. So storage and transportation is possible biomass. It is ecologically safe and is inoffensive because we cannot tell like that because combustion of biomass is again environmentally damaging that's why in fourth generation we are going for carbon dioxide capturing also so it will be zero emitting so we can't tell like it is completely ecologically safe there are some drawbacks also next topic government modifies solar park scheme the news is that government has modified the existing scheme for development of solar parks and ultra mega solar parks. Why this modification was necessary? There are two critical elements identified as roadblock to the solar park scheme. That is availability of land and availability of power evocation infrastructure for solar parks. The land availability issue is it is difficult to get acres of land to be dedicated to solar parks. So it needs the help from state governments and other institu institutions to acquire this land for solar park schemes. Power evocation is removal of the power generated from the solar parks and integrating it to the existing grid. So it should, it needs support from the existing power utilities. Transmission companies are there. So every state have their own transmission companies. So they have to extend their infrastructure up to the solar park so as to evocate the power generated from there. Usually the solar parks will be situated far away from the city for the land availability. So we have to ensure that this transmission infrastructure is also reaching those places to integrate that power to the grid. Then only this scheme will be successful. So after identifying these two critical elements, government has modified the existing scheme. What is the modification? 
there is a new mode is introduced how to develop the energy parks solar energy corporation of india is there on psu so they are made responsible to make land available so they have to cooperate with the state government they have to take the help of the state government and they identify the government and private lands that are available and acquire it and give for the successful bidders see these bidders who are these bidders they will be coming forward to set up the solar parks they will be private players or government agencies but whatever may be they will be selected to the tendering system to set up the solar park but for them the land will be provided by solar energy corporation of india it is not about financial assistance but there are other difficulties in acquiring land there will be different roadblocks like registration getting people's consent to give away their land so so many bureaucratic hurdles are there so the solar park developer should not be tangled in those obstacles and that part will be taken care by this corporation and land will be made available to them and it is to be noted that there is no fund from central financial assistance these people have to take care and this SECA will act as the solar power park developer the evacuation infrastructure of the parks developed by the external transmission development agency such as transmission utility so it has to be developed by external agency it's so this things are also has to be coordinated so the overall coordination is given to this corporation they will be coordinating with this parties to set up this evacuation infrastructure also and they will set up a payment security mechanism to make set to make setting up of renewable projects in such parts more attractive so people who are setting up projects there they have to be ensured the returns right for their investment for that their product should be purchased by somebody who is here to purchase it is mainly the transmission utilities they have to purchase if they are not purchasing then they cannot sell their power and uh, the whole project will go into losses and the solar park scheme will be a failure right so this cooperation will ensure that that their power will be purchased for that they are offering a payment security mechanism for the people to come up with for the people to come up to take up such projects so what is this solar park scheme it is to set up a number of solar parks across various states in the country so this will be having well developed infrastructure uh, so that risk and uh, the time to time for the projects to take off will be reduced right if everything is ready the project developers has to just go into the existing system and develop their own they have to specialize only in their power production so they don't have to bother about other extra extra requirements so that it will be less risky and it will be um, it will be coming to production more fast solar park will enable the states to bring in significant investment from project developers to meet its solar purchase obligation so we last slide we saw renewable power purchase obligation and in that there are two type two two sub categories solar purchase obligation and non solar renewable power purchase obligation so to give boost to solar projects in this renewable purchase obligation separate category is there solar purchase obligation that has to be met by the solar power only. so for meeting this obligation that has to be implemented by the state government uh, if solar park is coming in the state they will be able to meet their obligation so local population will be getting employment because this will be situated far from the city centers and all so uh, it will bring employment to the local people and it will reduce carbon footprint because it is renewable energy why this topic is important in 2017 ESC we had a question like consider the following statements regarding solar energy 
to encourage the adoption of solar energy production many state governments and center have announced plans by way of buyback as well as subsidies for installation second land acquisition of several hectares is a bottleneck in implementing this program third considerable energy effort need to bring down the cost of pv cells so all these statements are correct because central and state governments are giving special incentives and land acquisition is a major roadblock in implementing the program that's a new mode has come up now and we need R&D, R&D to develop the pho pho photovoltaic cells to low cost, flexible, less weight, more efficient photovoltaic cell means research in the material science that efforts has to be put in, in R&D. Answer is C. It is star rating program. The Ministry of Power has expanded its ambitious standards and labeling program. It is star rating program. Newly launched star rating program for microwave ovens and washing machines. So we have star rating for different electrical equipments. The star is for denoting the energy consumption. If you see your room heat, water heater or AC, or tube light we will be seeing one star two star three star like that ratings are there so more the stars the equipment has more energy efficient the equipment is that is it consumes less energy to identify the equipments that are energy efficient there is a program by ministry of power it is star rating program so the specialized agency is there bureau of energy efficiency B. They will. They have developed these standards, and they will inspect the equipments and give star rating according to their performance. So there will be a label on the equipment. Pension. It has launched the rating program for microwave ovens and washing machines. Now this will also come up with the star rating. Initially, the program for able to appliances will be on voluntary basis. So, we have different equipments covered under this program. There are mandatory and voluntary. Some equipments are covered under mandatory category. Some are under voluntary. So the customer is going for more star rated equipments they can save in the electricity bill. What is the aim for improving energy efficiency and lowering energy cost of appliances or equipments for the customer? consumers what is the larger aim larger aim is saving electricity if more consumers are buying energy efficient equipments it will add to more energy savings then what does this imply more energy savings means less emissions so we have seen the relation between the emissions and energy requirement energy is one of the major carbon day energy sector is one of the major greenhouse gas emitters so lesser energy means lesser ghg emissions and this rating program will create awareness among the consumers so they can buy energy efficient equipments. The manufacturers will be able to register products online. Uh, that portal is developed by BE and they can get their star labeling. So, so far these equipments are covered under star labeling program. You can just go through the list. Room air condition is there, ceiling fan, color television, computer, refrigerator distribution transformer stove uh, like that different equipments are covered and agriculture purpose pumps are also there generator is there among this the these equipments are under mandatory category that is frost free refrigerator tubular fluorescent lamps room air conditioners Color TV, IAC inverter, AC, uh, LED lamps, etc. are under mandatory category. You just remember the list. There may be questions from this topic. Because in UPSC civil service exam, there was a question regarding the equipments covered under the mandatory category. So, you just go through the list. About Bureau of Energy Efficiency, this is a statutory body under Ministry of Power. Statutory means it is formed after a law passed by the parliament that is Energy Conservation Act of 2001. It assists developing policies and strategies with the objective of 
reducing energy in intensity that is reducing the energy usage per equipment per person per entity whatever it is B coordinates with other stakeholders and utilizes existing resources and infrastructure in performing the functions assigned to it under Energy Conservation Act. So its main mandate to mandate is to implement the provisions under Energy Conservation Act. So under Energy Conservation, we have LED program, distribution of LED lamps, star rating program. So different programs are there. And they are mandated to implement those. So it is formulating the star rating program under this act. What could be the possible question? As I discussed before, there can be a question on the mandatory star labeling equipments. Which of the following appliances should be mand mandatorily star rated in India? Microwave oven, washing machine, water heaters, air conditioners, tube lights. So this microwave and washing machine was recently in use. So you may tend to tick this, but they are voluntary phase only just launched. Other the equipments are under mandatory phase. So here in hurry, you may make a mistake. So you should avoid such mistakes. Even though you have read the news in that impulse, you will uh, you feel like you know the answer and you will go with one, two, three, four, five. But it is voluntary only, so you have to be careful. Answer is C, 3, 4 and 5. Next topic is from ICT. National Knowledge Network. The news was that India has extended its National Knowledge Network to Bangladesh. So we have to see what is this network and why we have to extend it to Bangladesh. NKN is a... Multi gigabit pan India network. Pan India network means covering entire India. What it is covering? It is connecting about 1700 institutes. What are these institutes? They are IAMs, IITs, Indian Space Research Organization, VRTO, Central Universities, Medical Institutes like AIMS. So, this kind of higher education and research institutes are connected through separate network. So, that network is named as knowledge network. So, the name is important because it is aimed to develop the knowledge, knowledge in the country. So, it is about connecting different institutions which is dealing with the knowledge. So, it will connect the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. We have a cooperation between our South Asian neighbors that is SARC. SARC this name you will be familiar. So, we have to we have plans to expand this network to the institutions in SARC countries also. But not Pakistan. Pakistan is excluded. To connect all universities, research institutions, libraries, libraries also included, laboratories like CSIR laboratories, healthcare institutions agriculture institutions we have different agriculture dedicated to agriculture research we have many institutions in different parts of the country so this kind of institutes will be covered what is the aim aim is to enable knowledge and information sharing so nowadays if we see that many of the research is going to multidisciplinary we can't concentrate on a particular discipline to achieve something there is connection between different different disciplines in a single project itself so we need knowledge sharing between different institutes even though agriculture and healthcare may seem like not related but they have relation in the relation in different ways that can be utilized in researches so it will enable collaborative research cooperation between these institutions in research development and innovation, advanced distance education in specialized fields. So, if you need a distance education in specialized fields of engineering, science or medicine, this network can be utilized. So, this network has is designed to be high availability, quality of service, security, reliability. So, when we saw in our networking chapter there are different characters that define a high quality network that is it should be available 24 by 7 quality of service means that the amount of bandwidth that it uh, supports the buffering time should be less disruption should be less so this kind of 
parameters will define the quality of the service provided by the network so it should be a higher availability high quality of service security so the data transmitter should be secure it should not be eavesdropped by other third party and reliability reliability also related with the network parameter reliability has uh, dimensions like the network should be available plus the data transmitter should be going to the intended person and it should not be tampered in between so these qualities are incorporated in this network the purpose is building quality institutions with requested research facilities and to create a pool of highly trained professionals so this is envisaged as critical information infrastructure infrastructure for india so we have seen about critical information infrastructures that is essential for an economy so this why this knowledge network case as a critical information infrastructure for an economy so economy wise we have to trans transform towards a knowledge society so economic development will happens like that first it will start from an agrarian economy where agriculture based activities will be more then it will transform to industrial economy where industrial products production that will be the major sector then we will go to service sector where the service industry will take up the major share in the economy from there it is transition is to knowledge economy where knowledge based knowledge based services knowledge based activities will be having more share in economy than other sectors so now if you see in the world many countries in europe and america or south korea japan etc have shifted towards this knowledge society from the traditional industrial society because they are providing the high end high end knowledge services top uh, top most research and development activities and uh, technology transfer learning teaching etc so higher level of knowledge related activities happens in that economy so our aim is also to shift towards a knowledge society so this ngn is part of digital india program you just remember when there are one two three options somewhere it may come like ngn is part of digital india or not there for avoiding confusion if you remember this program you can go for opting the options easily and many government applications such as e governance e hospital and other related services ride on the back of this network okay this network can support different services so e governance can be supported to all these institutes which are connected since we have medical institutes also connected to this e hospital services can be connected to this network so such kind of e governance applications can also be run on this network what could be the possible questions from the topic national knowledge network can bring in paradigm shift in creating a knowledge society statement second knowledge must be integrated into an effective system of research institutions innovation driven enterprises universities and other establishment to create a knowledge society so we just discussed about knowledge society in that knowledge society there should be a collaboration between research institutions because whatever research happening there should come to the society right so it come to the economy it should come to the industry so we need enterprises that is driving on this innovations so there should be a connection between this research institutions and this innovation driven enterprises universities where budding talents are coming up and other establishment to create this link so it is a society where creation dissemination and utilization of information and knowledge has become the most important factor of production so some countries have already moved toward becoming a truly knowledge driven societies but many other countries in the world are remaining in industrial age some are still in essentially agrarian age so this is the knowledge society is the most advanced society now so this statement second statement explains the first statement because knowledge must be integrated and there should be there should be an effective system of different types of institutions to help this 
help this knowledge transmission for that the national knowledge network can play a greater role so it can bring a sudden shift Pad paradigm shift means sudden change from the existing to the new situation so it can bring a greater change in the scenario how this knowledge network is working in India knowledge integration is working in India how the different institutions are collaborating so second statement is explanation of first statement to, um, because the integration part is what the national knowledge network taking care of So this is for the month of March from the topic Environment, Energy and ICT. So in next video we will go to the next month.